This is Global Humanist Shop Talk. I'm M.L. Clark. The year is 789 AD. Our location, southwest of where we left off in episode one, The Making of Nations. We've crossed a body of water, moving from continental Europe with all its messy histories of 17th, 19th, and 20th century nation states to the northwest tip of Africa. Here, instead of the Holy Roman Empire, we have caliphates, and in local districts, emirates. The religion changes, but the idea remains the same. Societies organized locally under the idea that religion is a sound basis for broader governance, and that some families, under the auspices of royal lineage within those faith traditions, should have far-reaching control over surrounding areas. Except that if you're from a noble family and you don't agree with the family empire or caliphate, your best chance at survival lies in escape. That's what Idris ibn Abd Allah, great-great-great-grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, did when he ran afoul of the Abbasid Caliphate, which took its right to rule from a dynastic line starting with Muhammad's uncle. Just as in Europe, where the Roman Catholic Habsburg lineage would later spread out to govern and compete over many regions, so too did families claiming blood ties to Muhammad forge Islamic dynasties across northern Africa and the Middle East. And so Idris went about conquering and collecting parts of northwest Africa into what would become known as Morocco. There are many claims to the first state or the first nation, Japan, China, the little island of San Marino. Many countries plainly came into being long before the common era, let alone before a few core centuries in recent history where historians make such grand claims about this event or that treaty forever transforming the world and ushering in the next era of international relations. But Morocco's claim to fame as a modern state offers a fascinating echo to the Western history we discussed in episode one. Morocco, for any US listeners, is also of importance in your history of statehood because the Kingdom of Morocco would one day be the first sovereign nation to allow ships with US flags to enter its waters, months before France issued the first formal recognition of the US itself. What exactly made Idris I's actions back in 789 so different from prior political arrangements? The region hadn't been empty before him after all. We have record of tribes and precursor populations going back to the Paleolithic in the region. Also, when Idris arrived, his path to leadership involved entering into agreements with a local Berber tribe that occupied the Roman-built city of Volubilis. It was these Berbers, the Araba people, who declared him an imam, and it's that action which granted him authority as he moved through and staked his claim on the rest of the region. Even just in this description, though, you can surely hear the layers upon layers of existing nations, established city-states, and pre-existing notions of sovereignty to be given up or held against external attack. So what, amid such a messy backdrop, actually made Morocco a contender for the first modern state? Was it the founding of a city, Fez? Even though Idris's son would build his own rival city across the river? Was it the minting of Morocco's own coins with a seal that expressly defined itself in opposition to the Abbasid Caliphate? Even though that very act of defiance could only take place if another country was already minting its own currency too? Or was it simply the mass migration of many Arab peoples along with Jewish and Christian populations to the promise of this freshly pulled together territory? Did sheer human hope in the project of Morocco give it this special status? Even though plenty of other regions in the same era also had clearly defined territories, coherent and distinct ruling bodies and customs, and the machinery of state enterprise in full swing. 
This problem of definition has haunted our discussion of political science for as long as the field has existed, and yet in everyday discourse, we tend to throw around terms like the state or the nation without anywhere near the level of uncertainty that they deserve, for they truly are arbitrary concepts into which we infuse meaning based on context and need. A nation is a group of people with shared features, one of which may or may not be living in the same land under the same government. A state, meanwhile, could be made up of multiple nations. What they share is a political arrangement within a specific territory, even if not every nation within that territory is as well represented as it wants to be. Even if every nation under the land does not in practice share a mutual interest. And what is this political arrangement exactly? because there are so many forms of government, so what exactly do they share? What's the common denominator? One of the best summations of this situation is just over a hundred years old and speaks to how little we've really developed our understanding of formal terminology in so many decades since. In the Foundations of Sovereignty and Other Essays, Author H.J. Lasky frames his critical task by declaring that, quote, nothing today is more greatly needed than clarity upon ancient notions, sovereignty, liberty, authority, personality. These are the words of which we want alike the history and the definition, or rather we want the history because its substance is in fact the definition, end quote. To translate that elegant remark from 1921, there is no accurate way to sum up what a state is except by going through the history of what specific organizational structures we call states have been. And that's where things get messy. Because as much as we might have a strong, abstracted sense of the nation, our nation, other nations, in practice we're all not much different than those migrating throngs in Northwest Africa in the late 8th and early 9th century. Moving away from ideas of society that did not serve us well, leaning into the vague promise of a new arrangement that maybe will appealing in the process to some platonic ideal of a collective agreement to live well together and to apply ourselves well together within a specific shared context. Now, if you want a bigger analysis of such ideas, please check out some of the wonderful historiography that's lately been pushing back on rigid European histories of philosophy, political science, cultural anthropology, and ethnology. David Graeber and David Wengrau's The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity from 2021 is rightly acclaimed as an exploration of how Enlightenment-era myths of progress from simpler to more complex societal structures do not accurately reflect the far more fluid set of human arrangements in ancient history. But if you also haven't read Wengrow's 2010 What Makes Civilization, you're missing out on important insights with respect to the making of city-states and the domestic work that goes into building today's most persistent myths about stable society. Also thought-provoking is James C. Scott's 2017 Against the Grain, a deep history of the early estates, which reflects on the role of indentured labor in forming what we often incorrectly presume to be superior arrangements of human society. But for our purposes, what really matters is that we practice putting aside all the arbitrary histories attached to our creation stories for specific states in Europe, as in North Africa, as in many other sectors of the world. Because when we're too busy focusing on abstracted ideals, we limit our ability to see where grand notions of the nation and the state have sheltered governing principles that aren't serving us well. After all, it's that mental flip, that moment when we better understand how agency can be enhanced or lessened by our policies and cultures, which this humanist podcast always sets out to explore, one everyday object or concept at a time. You're listening to Global Humanist Shop Talk, and for six episodes, we're extracting a deeper understanding of contemporary global politics through a study of petro-nationalism, the formation 
maintenance and advancement of countries through the oil and gas industries they have created, traded in, and otherwise leveraged for international power at cost to the humans in the mall. The fantasy of the Westphalian system discussed in episode one and the decision to call Morocco the first modern state in some histories of political science share an important binding thread. Both stories about the start of the nation state involve acts of resistance to pre-existing imperial societies. The implicit argument in both cases is that the modern nation state emerges wherever a single territory strives to resist a more all-consuming international order. The danger of this idea, though, is that it presents as even possible a clean separation of sovereign state interests from broader systems of power. It promises that we, as humans, need not be governed indirectly by sweeping, self-interested groups that are only loosely beholden to geopolitical limits. It invites us to imagine worlds where our internal politics are ever truly and completely disconnected from external encroachment. Once we go secular, we're home free, right? Except, not really. Certainly, the Holy Roman Empire no longer exists nor does the Ottoman Empire, and the vast medieval caliphates have also by and large been swept away. But in their place are massive industries with outsized power that continue to shape our fates within what we overconfidently call our sovereign borders. And just as many religious empires were never fully separate from local government actions in our so-called nation states, so too is it a grave mistake to treat industry and the institution of the corporation as something separate from state governments too. Which is why in this mini-series we're reframing the history of modern nation states through a much more pragmatic look at the highly unsovereign government practices that have been with them, with us, all along. I know I keep promising talk of oil and gas and we'll get to petroleum industry specifically, starting in the next episode. But first, we need to establish the well-traveled economic grooves in which petroleum will eventually run. Because the modern oil economy is very recent. Launching in the mid-1800s in the US and not even engaging another of the world's biggest players, Saudi Arabia, until 1938. So we'll get there, I promise. But the wheels of industry have sustained our myths of nation-states, of sovereignty and liberty for a whole lot longer. And it's those far more practical pillars of modern governance that we keep shrouding in myths of national identity and the secular state, to the detriment of our ability to think clearly and critically about how to build better social contracts for us all. Like the nation-state, the concept of the corporation has a modern meaning that obscures much of its history. As with the nation-state, there's been a great deal of historical hand-waving from theorists trying to separate this construct from other arrangements used to accumulate funds and build capacity around given projects. Now mind you, the earliest corporations were state projects, very different from the bureaucratic models we know and often rail against today. In the most common story of the first corporations, an industrious group would gather around a common interest, such as the building of a bridge or hospital or university, and receive state sanction through a charter to develop their nonprofit venture. In other words, they were creating their own jobs under sitting government and providing public services of use to surrounding community. The state could withdraw its charter for these groups if their stated purpose hadn't been achieved, and it often took a very active regulatory role in all activities within these finished public works. That's one version of the story, at least. However, history is filled with attempts to set arbitrary lines in the sand, territories of meaning that do not map well onto their intended reference. So we should ask ourselves how much of a difference really exists 
between these corporate bids by a given group to gain state sanction for a domestic project and, oh, say, the petitions for state funding or funding by the sitting monarchs of a state that went into setting up a colonial expedition, a stated intention to set out and seize far-off lands, expand empire, enslave local populations, and otherwise establish international vassal states dedicated to improving original state holdings. In one version of this corporate history, Britain's East India Company is notoriously set up as the first such enterprise. A group of mercantile adventurers granted a charter by Queen Elizabeth I in 1600 and establishing the world's first commercial, which is to say, for personal profit corporation. The East India Company expanded massive trade routes into and out of Asia and ruled horrifically in India where it conquered and subjugated to its own economic ends, all vaguely in the name of the country that had first sanctioned its existence. The British East India Company wasn't alone, of course. The Dutch East India Company was founded in 1602, and the Dutch West India Company followed along in 1621. But what made these organizations notable for historians, for economists, and for political scientists was that these formal constructs were not strictly tied to the original participants. Rather, they created a legal category in which a financial organization could and would exist beyond the lifespan or interest of any given investor. And this abstracted entity, this phantom under the law, also better protected individuals from personal liability. From then on, the corporation would be at fault and the corporation would have to pay which of course gave individuals far more leeway to see themselves as less personally responsible for whatever heinous things that a corporation might do in service to its primary profit motive. Or so this history goes, because again, we need to be suspicious of any story that tries to pin down a given starting point or otherwise claim a total transformation in political theory in the wake of a specific event. After all, we have evidence of corporations of this type long before Britain and Holland set sail with their mercantile dreams of exploiting other lands. In his 1952 thesis on a series of floating mill projects in Toulouse, France, Hermann Sicard noted that a medieval partnership model called pariage allowed these 14th century arrangements to exist beyond the lifespan or interest of individual participants. People came together to build these impressive and profitable works on state land, and they could divest themselves of personal holdings in the venture without the venture falling apart. Conversely, too, the establishment of the East and West India trading companies didn't suddenly disappear the existence of non-profit public works corporations. In the United States after the American Revolution, for instance, charters were routinely given for 10 to 40 year projects to develop critical infrastructure for the still nascent and still settling U.S. landscape. These charters provided and subsidized work led by enterprising groups that would serve many in a given region, and yet they also operated within a finite window without legal parameters to carry them beyond their initial community-oriented purposes. And also, as much as political scientists and economists really want to split hairs, what exactly was the difference between the British East India Company's charter and the monarchical backing granted to Christopher Columbus for his horrific voyages out from Spain, ostensibly to develop overseas trade relationships and secure access to new wealth? Is it really just that the latter had a profit motive for state coffers, and the former presented an opportunity for a merchant class to accumulate wealth for itself too? We generally don't like tying the idea of monarchs pooling investment capital to fund state-sanctioned slave projects into modern notions of the corporation. Even if the East India Company was as brutal in Asiatic countries as Christopher Columbus had been in the Americas, there's an arbitrary dividing line we place between the two. At least when the East India Company trespassed, the implicit argument goes, it was really this phantom legal entity, the corporation, doing the trespassing. Conversely, Christopher Columbus, who was criticized even in Spain at the time for his actions in the Americas, had no legal subterfuge to hide behind. 
but the staff of those East India companies and the West India Company and other exploitative European corporations often found personal, moral shelter under this freshly developed legal sleight of hand. Which brings us to the bigger issue and the reason I've been harping on about history's over-fondness of talking about states and nations, corporations and the people in abstracted and idealized terms. From whence does this legal coverage come for the unconscionable acts of human beings singly and in groups, if not from the state itself? Who but the state gives colonial expansion projects, along with local corporate projects, either in service to the public or in pursuit ultimately of personal profit, the legitimacy to exist at all? This is the issue we've gotten used to avoiding in global political discourse. When we talk about the problems caused for us by out-of-control corporate monopolies, we often treat them as both a new and an external threat to the core of our state projects. But the history of our histories of progress tells a far different story. A story wherein, for centuries, we've tried to define the modern nation-state as something it has never been removed from the influence of self-interested parties, which both receive sanction from individual countries and also strive to stand apart from them as embodiments of something more far-reaching. In past centuries, the struggle for autonomy played out against religious empires and we wrongly rested on our laurels as having overcome the main theoretical problem when we established more firmly secular societies, nation-state projects with clear dreams of self-determination. But all throughout that same history of society, we have had groups of people come together under a common interest, a profit motive, that states have variously taken up as their own or sanctioned others to pursue within given territory. As we'll explore in episode 3, Why We Moil for Oil, this matters because the history of corporate enterprise has become the history of the nation-state. While political scientists, historians, and economists variously talk about the need for a new world order, a new framework for thinking about sovereign states and the people who inhabit them, a very old way of actually organizing our societies has, in just under the last two years, come to shape the destiny of us all. Beyond the sovereign state, there is petro-nationalism. Join me next time as we explore how this industry's refinement of older corporate practices has shaped everything about power brokerage in the modern world. This has been Global Humanist Shop Talk with ML Clark. Maurizio Ferraz is my one-man dream team of an audio production specialist. Studio space and resources were provided by Agencia El Grifo, and all further credits for cited and referenced content can be found in attached episode notes. All of this would not have been possible without my patrons, the vast majority of whom support me through Patreon. You can also follow my work at Better Worlds Theory, a weekly newsletter at mlclark.substack.com. None of us excels without the support of a community, and I am deeply thankful to have found mine. Be well, be kind, and seek justice where you can.